Namaste, sir. Thank you very much, Samir. Thank you very much, colleagues. I will, I will share my screen and at the same time, I will switch off my camera just to save the bandwidth, if you will pardon me for that. Just share my screen with you. Um, uh, colleagues, I would love to share with you some thoughts on being and becoming a networked researcher and scholar. I would just like to acknowledge that the, this, uh, the images that I've used in this presentation does not belong to me. I acknowledge the copyright and licensing regime of images use. And this presentation, excluding the images, is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 international license. Just as a short overview of the presentation, I would like to locate ourselves. I'd like to explore scholarship. When is someone a scholar? Uh, higher education research as field, playing the field, considerations for playing, some thoughts on a personal journey in scholarship and research towards network scholarship. Then I would like to, to, to reflect with you on what is holding you back from realizing your scholarship and being a scholar and researcher, and then some closing notes. I believe that becoming and being a networked researcher and scholar depends on our context. And I'm very aware that both India and South Africa are seen as part of the global self. And I'm particularly intrigued how our geopolitical context, being in the global self, outside of the global north, shape our identities, shape our potential as scholars and researchers, and shape how our research and our scholarship are seen. So how do we speak of becoming a network, a researcher and scholar in, the, or let me just go back, in the global self, considering our international and national location, considering our institutional location at the University of Kerala or the University of South Africa, our disciplinary location, and then our gender, our culture, our socioeconomic circumstances. I do believe that our context is multi-layered so it's not only our being in the global self that shapes our scholarship and teaching, but also our institutional context, uh, how the University of Kerala shaped your, your scholarship, your identity as a researcher, how your specific discipline, either in education or history or sociology, shaped your identity. And then finally, how your gender, your culture, your socioeconomic circumstances shape your research identity and your trajectory as a researcher and scholar. This was published in 2013 by a colleague of mine, Laura Ternovich, in which she spoke about the inequitable power dynamics of global knowledge production and exchange that must be confronted head on. And this map she meant she refers to in her article that shows a proportional map of how the different continents contribute to global knowledge production. You will see the US is very huge, the Europe is very huge, India is there, it's fairly huge, and then Africa is almost totally absent from the map. So when I contribute my research, when I do research, I'm very aware that I'm part of this small green enclave at the bottom of the map. The article also refers to the paradox of publishing in top tier journals from the periphery. And the author Rolf Hofmann makes it very clear that one, once one is outside of the global north, one, once one research is seen as on the periphery or on the margins, it's very hard to publish in top tier journals. So how do we think of writing for publication? How do we think about scholarship in the context of the very nature of being a scholar? To make known what you know. The institutional pressures to publish, the rankings and the ratings, the many opportunities to publish, to make known, to share, to get input. 
the beauty and the danger of the immediacy of living on life versus a long traditional publication process. On life refers to that we're no longer living online and offline, but on life. So how does that shape our publication? How does that shape our scholarship? Alternative forms of publishing may support the more conventional forms of sharing and peer review, and then the nature of scholarship and the sharing of research thinking and praxis has changed. I do apologize for the background sound to my presentation. We're having a, a late autumn thunderstorm in South Africa. Central to the question of academic publishing is the issue of scholarship. So when is someone a scholar and how do we know? I wish I could have been with you in person to share this image with you and then share, share hear from you who, you who would know who this person is. And it's actually Hipparchia. She was born very early in the common era. She was a Hellenistic New Platonist philosopher, astronomer, mathematician. She lived in Alexandria, Egypt. She was a prominent thinker of the New Platonic School in Alexandria, where she taught philosophy and astronomy. And she is the first female mathematician whose life is reasonably well recorded. And why I share this with you is to illustrate that not only her position in Alexandria, Egypt shaped her, 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 her scholarship, but also her gender and then specifically her gender in the field of philosophy and mathematics, astronomy, disciplines that were dominated by male. So just a warning, the field is rigged. I, I hope you know the name of the, the game Monopoly where one player is given all the property except this property called Whitechapel Road and then why they are also given 90% of the bank. And then you're invited to play Monopoly with this person and you are expected to succeed with what's left. And of course you lose immediately. And then the accusation, why it must be because you're lazy. For many female scholars, for many scholars from the global self, if they don't get cited, if their works don't get cited, if they don't become prominent scholars and academics and researchers, they are accused of not trying hard enough. And meanwhile, we forget that the playing field was not equal and level and that the field was rigged from the start almost against them. So what does it mean to be a scholar? I think it's, it's very easy to define being a researcher, but it's more difficult to define what is a scholar and what are the differences between a scholar and a researcher. In my view, being and becoming a scholar means you have academic expertise in a particular field or fields and disciplines but your field of expertise and your ac academic expertise is also recognized by an institution. So one institution awarded you a degree, the University of Kerala examined you and they awarded the PhD to you. So that's, that, that, that's very important. You are recognized to have expertise. But then there's also a broad acknowledgement by the gatekeepers in the discipline, the field of inquiry. Then there's also recognition by your academic peers. So not everyone with a PhD has the recognition by their peers. Then there's also the issue of maintaining and expanding your expertise. It's no longer good enough just to have a PhD, but you continue reading, you continue expanding your expertise and your understanding of the field. You disseminate your thinking, your research, your practice. You yourself becomes a gatekeeper or a peer when you review funding application, when you review articles for a journal. And then there's also the commitment to develop and recognize the expertise of others. Now, I suspect that scholar, being a scholar versus being a researcher depends almost on the last five bullets. 
that you are acknowledged by your peers, by the gatekeepers, that you, you consciously expand and maintain your expertise. You disseminate your thinking. You don't keep your thinking for yourself. You are a gatekeeper. You review articles. You review funding applications. But you also develop the, and recognize the expertise of others. To understand our positionality and our identity as researchers and scholars, it's very important to understand higher education research as field. Firstly, I want to point out to the impact of global rankings on higher education research and the production of knowledge. And I rely on a very early article by E. Hazelcorn in 2009. And although it's uh, almost uh, 10, more, more than 11 years old, I would like you to point you to her table where she reviews the three different ranking systems and what they what their indicators are. So the first one you will see is the Shanghai Zhao Tong ranking of world universities. Then there's the Times QS World University ranking, and then the Taiwan performance rankings are scientific papers for research universities. You will see the first one, they weigh the quality of education, 10%, the quality of faculty the number of, of Nobel Prizes, 20%, research output, 20%, number of articles, together counts 40%, and then the size of the institution. Times Q is World University Rankings, you will see they allocate 20% uh, to research quality and citations per faculty. And then the Taiwan Performance Rankings place a high emphasis on research productivity. You can see there all their criteria relates to research and research outputs. This is very interesting. Again, Hazelcorn points that in countries, what do they use as indicators for research? You will see in Slovakia, the amount of money you get as a researcher counts per amount. The grants per faculty is also in Italy. Research projects is very prominent in Italy. Participation in international research programs acknowledged as a key indicator in Poland. And you can, I will share the, the presentation with Samir and he can distribute it to you. But you can just see how the number of articles and the funding that we bring in as researchers are paramount in national contexts. In a very interesting article by Fauzi and his colleagues in 2020, they point out some methodological flaws in these ranking systems. And this is very interesting. You will see that there's, there's a five vertical tables. There's a QS index, or QS index in the first one, then there's the Times 2018, RAW 2018, and then Leiden, and then Bebo metrics. The number of universities ranked is indicated in the first horizontal uh, bar. Then QS has six metrics, Times has 13 per performance indicators, ARW has 26, Leiden only used Webometric Scientific and then Webometrics Web Presence. And there you can see, just, let's just look at the, the last horizontal column. QS Times Higher Education, 40% of how the university is ranked comes from academic re reputation. And you can see the rest. So colleagues, our reputation as scholars and our reputation as research depend on how we are valued, how much we produce, and how much money we bring to our universities through international research grants. My question is, if that is important, how do we play the field? This is my Google research, the Google Scholar profile, and I don't share this with you to show off. I share with you to show you and share with you key indicators. You will see on top of the bar graph, there are citations. There's the H index and the I10 index. Now the H index is an offer level metric that measures both the productivity 
and the citation impact of publication of a scientist and scholar. And the age index correlates with obvious success factors such as winning the Nobel Prize, being accepted for research fellowships, and holding positions at top universities. So if you would search your own Google Scholar profile, your age index provides you with a very crucial indicator of your impact or your lack of impact. And as we have seen, your lack of impact can depend on your context, the language in which you publish, your, your institutional context, your gender, your culture, a range of factors. The I-10 index refers to the number of publications with at least 10 citations. And both these quotes come from Wikipedia. So you see, I have 2,582 citations and my H index is 26 and my I-10 index is 39. And these figures, my research and my being researcher, my being a scholar is quantified. And sometimes this makes me very uncomfortable because my, my being a researcher and a scholar is, there's more to it than just quantification of who I am. We also have to understand the field of academic scholarship and research as with, with this pressure to increase our age index, with this pressure to produce number of articles per year, the, this article from 2017 reflects on many academics are eager to publish in worthless journals. We, you just need to, because you must publish two articles a year, you, just, you don't care where you publish as long as it is published. There's also an increasing uh, trend from, this is from 2016 and it continues that academics want you to read their work for free. You know that most of the journals, once you've submitted your article, the readers can only access your article if they, their institutions are uh, uh, subscribed to that journal. And there's a trend towards open publishing. And of course, if you publish your work in an open journal, you will get more citations. This is from 2019 that Norway joins the list of countries canceling Elsevier contracts. There's a push back against the paywall of journals. And this is to be continued. And this article, colleagues, from 2018, for me, is profound. When I reflect on the fact that most of my research and my scholarship is quantified and that I have to play these numbered games, this article really resonated with me. Two quotes from the article. Academic disciplines in our time have been subjected to the principle that more productivity is better and a lot more is better than better giving rise to a kind of productivity syndrome. Quantity is much easier to evaluate. Professor X has 18 articles, 12 book reviews, 21 conference presentations. American culture more broadly has become monomanically infatuated with productivity as a marker of successful life. And so, so I think this was the last slide you most probably saw. Academic culture, like American culture more broadly, has become monomanically infatuated with productivity as a marker of a successful life. And quantitative measures have become central to determining what counts as success. Although academics can be found resisting mindly the metrics of productivity foisted on them by administrators, they also enthusiastically measure themselves. And this is problematic for me, colleagues, in the sense that however I am uncomfortable with being measured with the quantity of articles I produce, yet I'm very aware of my H index. I check weekly whether my H index has improved. So feeling anxious, you're not the only one. And this is from two favorite of my colleagues, academic labor and performance anxiety, Richard Hall writes, where the shame of not performing becomes a central tenet of everyday academic life. And academics overwork because the current culture in universities is brutally 
and deliberately invested in shaming those who don't compete effectively. In contrast with the heroic few who do somehow meet the shifting goalposts. This is from a favorite author of mine where he says, we are created and recreated by metrics. We live through them, with them and within them. Metrics facilitate the making and remaking of judgments about us. The judgments we make of ourselves and the consequences of those judgments as they are felt and experienced in our lives. We play with metrics and we are often more often played by them. Two last slides about metrics. Those things that cannot be counted are rendered invisible and those that can be counted achieve visibility. And I want, to you, I want you to reflect with me which of your aspects of scholarship are invisible to the rankings, invisible to the counting, and which have become, have gained visibility. And this is in the author uh, beer. When numbers are used alone, the world is reduced to numbers and measured to what is calculable and laid before us. When humans are summed, aggregated and accounted for, then much remains forgotten, unsaid, concealed. And my reflection with you tonight and this afternoon is how much of your scholarship remains forgotten, unsaid, concealed, because it cannot be counted. So considering these criteria and the fact that you and I are faced with this quantification game, how do you make your, recognize, your expertise known? And this slide you will recognize from earlier, and I just highlighted the number of times I mentioned recognition, acknowledgement, recognition, dissemination. So how do you make your expertise known? This slide you have on the left at the bottom conventional publishing, and then on the right you have unconventional publishing, and you will see it is a spectrum. Conventional publishing in higher education refers to monographs <coughs> where you are the sole author, <clears throat> edited volumes, peer-reviewed articles in journals that are listed by a number of databases, that's conventional publishing. Unconventional publishing, what I propose to you, are blogs, your presence on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, when you write an opinion piece, when you write letters to the editors and articles and magazines. And the question that I would like to pose to you, how do you choose? I suspect most of us play in the green field, the conventional publishing. That's where we are counted. And that's where our status as a researcher gains prominence. My question is, how much do we play in the unconventional publishing in higher education? And how do these two fields overlap? So what are the rules? If I play soccer, there are certain rules and the, the, the shape of the field is, is very different from when I play rugby, hockey, or baseball. So when all these, these types of games and sports have their own rules, what are the rules of playing in this conventional, unconventional publication field? So how do I choose colleagues? <clears throat> I think it's very important to first ask where and how does my publication of this article fit into my career, short term, longer term. Established researchers have the privilege to, to make this decision very differently from when I'm an emergent scholar, not having tenure. When I have tenure, I can go into unconventional publishing. I have more freedom. When I'm a younger scholar, I can almost not consider publishing outside of the green field because it won't be counted. So where and how does this publication fit into my career, short term and longer term? What are the reputational benefits and risks if I go to the right or to the left? 
what are the rules? There's very certain rules when I publish in conventional higher education. And what are the rules when I go to <clears throat> unconventional publications? What needs to be shared? What is the content that you need? Is it profound evidence? Is it research? Is it thoughts? Is it reflections? I would propose that research and scholarship is much more than a rigorous empirical research articles. I may also have reflections. I may also have the beginnings of a conceptual framework that won't be accepted in the green part of conventional publishing, but that may be accepted in the unconventional publishing field. How accessible wall should it be? If you really want your research to be out there, where should you publish? Who is the intended audience and why? <clears throat> Who will be the peer reviewers and how will peer review happen impact? Conventional publication has a very set and a very agreed upon system of peer review. How does peer review work in unconventional publishing? And who are the gatekeepers? And then fine, finally, how urgent are the findings as a message? A colleague of mine from the context of the US is doing research on how the big global education uh, venture capitalists uh, market their their materials, their software, their platforms to schools. And the information and the research findings is so hot, he cannot wait for the article to be published in conventional publishing. So he decided to publish it in Times, in, in the New York Times. So that's the type of decisions we increasingly will face. So where do I start, colleagues? <clears throat> Consider your brand of being and becoming a networked scholar and researcher. I want you to consider two questions. If your peers and broader academic community think of your research and you as a scholar and a researcher, how do they describe your research and you as a scholar and a researcher? If I had the privilege to be with you in person, I would have taken uh, on the opportunity to engage with you as an audience to say, when people talk about your research, what do they say? Is there, this, is there this golden thread in your research or is your research all over the place? How do they describe your research and you as a scholar and a researcher? And the second question is, how would you like to be known for pertaining to your research and your, you being a scholar and researcher? How would you like to be known? What do you like your research to be known for? And once we have very clear clarity on these choices, colleagues, then we need to make the right choices. I was really privileged to have a vice principal academic and research that asked me, Paul, what do you need to, how do you want to be seen by the researcher community? What do you want to achieve as a scholar and researcher? How do you want to be known? And after she asked me, I really spent some time thinking of how, what is my answer? And since I, I, I got a sense of who I want to be, who I, how I want to be seen, that really helped me to start playing the field of higher education research. So once you have this idea of who you are, how you want your research to be seen, how you want to be seen as a scholar and a researcher, it's very important to establish a golden thread in your research. Um, it's very important to choose your journals carefully. And on the, on the right, you will see I have printed a, or I've included a small figure of a small image of Schimago journal and country rank. You can search any journal there and you can get access to what is the journal's impact factor, who are the readers, how accessible are the, 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 the journals, articles? Choose your conferences carefully. Uh, before COVID, when we used to travel, I suspect many academics, if they had funding, would go to any conference just to see the country. Now with, with COVID and virtual conferences, we, 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 we don't see countries and it's very important to choose your conferences carefully where will your sharing of your research get the most impact, the most attention? 
choose and grow your network. Um, how big is your network? Who's in your network? Where is your network? Care for and sustain your network. It's not only important to be part of a network in India or the University of Kerala. How wide does your network go and how can you expand your network and how can you care and sustain this network? Then read, write, fail and try again. And now for the last part of my presentation, I would like to show you and share with you how I play this field. But before I get there, just three slides about licensing. It's important that you take cognizance of Creative Commons licenses. <clears throat> you saw in the beginning of my slides, I said this presentation is published under a certain Creative Commons license. And basically, these are the six licenses. The left hand one is that you, your authorship will always be acknowledged, but people are allowed to adapt it, to change it as long as you are acknowledged. The second, on the, uh, the second one on the left hand column is you always will be acknowledged, but they're allowed to change it, but then they must share the changes with you. The third one in the vertical column says they must acknowledge you and they cannot sell your ideas. They cannot include the book from which they will profit. And because of a lack of time, I will leave the rest of the slides to you. You will see the right hand one is share alike and non-commercial. Then no derivatives, they cannot change it. The second one in the vertical column on the right and then they must acknowledge you, they cannot make money, they cannot profit from your research, and they're not allowed to, to, to change your work. So there's various options of publishing your research. The second slide is stay away from predatory journals. There's a lot of journals out there that would invite you to contribute an article, and then <clears throat> they would offer you that they will publish your article if you would pay a certain amount of fees. And I'm not talking about page fees, I'm talking about publication fees. These are known as predatory journals. And though this list has been uh, not reviewed since 2017, the BIUS list still provide you with a list of questionable journals. Please don't publish in them. Once you, you have a publication in them, um, your, your reputation as scholar is just suspect. Please take note of this wonderful resource by Goody and Cernovich, Academics Online Presence, a four-step guide to take control of your visibility. The link is there. Now my personal journey, colleagues. Uh, and again, this is a very reflective journey I would like to share with you how I see my journey, how I play the field, how I disseminate my findings, my research and my, my reflections. Uh, on my very important in my research is my Twitter. You see, I don't have that many followers. Uh, I have very, I follow very even fewer people. I, Twitter has become the main source of my inspiration. Uh, the main source where I get the latest research findings on technology, on educational technology, on privacy, on learning analytics, on higher education. So this has become, a, this is vital for my own research. So I don't only use Twitter to get information. Whenever I find something, I also share it to my network. I also created for myself a critical educators list. You will see I only have 62 members. So because going through Twitter in the mornings take a lot of time, I selected from my list of, of 600 and something people that I follow, I've selected 62 very crucial people that if I don't have a lot of time, I only look at what they've published, what they've shared. So, some scholars say that Twitter does not work for them. And this reminds me of walking into a library and expecting books to find you. Twitter is this massive amount of information and using Twitter as scholar requires effort, dedication, a careful consideration of who to follow, 
a willingness to be surprised and dealing with an abundance of stimulation. So when I think of me being a scholar and a researcher, Twitter is foremost in my research. Then Facebook, I know Facebook is, is, is a very controversial platform because of the way they collect data. I use my uh, Facebook as a scholarly platform. You can, you can use your Facebook for family to share recipes, to keep in touch with family overseas. For me, it's very important to use Facebook as a scholarly platform. Uh, I have people on my Facebook page that I don't even have their institutional email addresses. So Facebook for me is crucial in, is in keeping intact, in contact with my network. Using Facebook as scholar also brings to the fore the increasing disappearance of public, private, professional, personal. And I made the choice that, that I'm playing this field. Uh, I don't, I want to be visible. Even I share my, my failures when an article was rejected. I share it on Facebook. I want to live open, but it's again your choice. So it's first Twitter and then Facebook. Then I have a blog, wordpress.com, um, where I share blogs, where people can read it. Uh, I started blogging in 2012, I think, and you can see here on the right below my picture profile, I've had 40,517 hits. And I share them, this number with you not to, to brag or to, to, be, uh, uh, to put myself in the foreground, but blogging is a powerful way to share tentative thoughts, to share reflections, to share uh, works in progress. This is uh, from the moment I started blogging. This is where my followers are. You will see I have had 10, almost 11,000 views from the United States, South Africa, United Kingdom, and I even have 1,574 people from India that look at my work on my blog post. This is the, the, the index of which of my blogs got the most hits. And you'll see this, this blog that I wrote, the third from the top, the selfish giant and the unlocking of the gates of elitist higher education, got almost 2,500 views. If I have an article that have that many views, I will be so glad, colleagues. So this blog provides you with a space to make my research known. Many people have found me on my blog and then they look for my scholarly articles. Another way I use my, or I used to use my research is through SlideShare, where I would post every presentation I make. You will see the, the, the uh, slide or the, the picture on the left is open digital and public towards the scholarship of refusal. I've had 706 views there. So I used to upload all my presentations to SlideShare. And this is remarkable, colleagues. The middle presentation was a presentation I did for my department uh, four years ago. And it was attended by, I think, 25 people. I shared the presentation online afterwards. And up to today, I've had close to 12 thousand views on that presentation. And for me, this, this, this illustrates how powerful going digital, how powerful it is to start sharing your, your, your research and your thoughts outside journal articles in unconventional platforms. In the previous slide, I mentioned that I used to upload my, my slides to SlideShare. I stopped doing that because they're not searchable. I can, I, can, sir, I can post the link to my slides on Twitter and Facebook, and then people can look. But if you would search the title of a presentation, you won't find it. And that made me to move away from SlideShare to posting my, 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 my uh, presentations and my articles on ResearchGate, another platform. You will see 
um, the number of citations, reckon people would read my articles here and they would recommend it to others. I've had close to 40,000 reads. There you will see the profile. LinkedIn is, is the, the, I think, the final point or platform that I want to share. Personally, LinkedIn has not created a lot of buzz for me as researcher. I would share things there that I found. I would share my presentations there and people will find me on LinkedIn and then they would make contact. But it's an essential part of being a researcher. So colleagues, I'm almost closing. So what is holding you back from becoming and being a researcher and scholar? Is it that you don't have the academic expertise yet, you're still busy with your PhD? Is it uh, the fact that you are not acknowledged by the gatekeepers? Are you having difficulty to maintain and expand your expertise? Uh, is it the issue of dissemination of thinking, research praxis? Uh, what is keeping you back? It's very important that we understand the field not only the field of higher education research, but also understand your choices and considering your response. You are at the University of Kerala. I am at the University of South Africa. My department requires a certain amount of outputs of, from me per year. I must publish five single authored articles in three years. If I publish uh, with authors, if I co-author an article, then I must publish 10 articles in three years. So I don't know what your institutional arrangement is, but our institutional context the bed, uh, or impacts a huge lot on, on our research. My discipline impacts on my research, as well as my gender, my culture, my socioeconomic circumstances. Digital networks often allow us to overcome come the constraints of location. Colleagues, I'm, I'm, I, I'm in South Africa and you are in India. And what will make an, a researcher from America or South America or Australia? What will, what will prompt a researcher from these contexts to look at your research, to find you? Are you findable? Can they find you or are you, are you just not, not present? So how will they find you? Where will they find you? Why would they like to find you? And digital networks allow us to overcome the constraints of location. But digital networks are also not neutral and per se benevolent. There are dangers out there. If I'm a female scholar, the potential of being harassed online is much bigger than when I'm a male scholar. So there are dangers. Networks don't only include, but also exclude. Uh, the most ferocious uh, example of peer review was an online peer review where colleagues of mine published a report online of what they've written. And the response of other people in the field, scholars in the field were ferocious. It was immediately and the review was public. So digital networks is a different playing field, but for me as a researcher is very valuable. In closing, I think it's important that we ask the question, why do you want to become and be a scholar and researcher? What is this burning? What's this burning inside you? Why do you want to become and be a scholar? And what changes and will change as a result of you becoming and being a scholar and researcher? Who will you answer to in your scholarship and research? Who will hold you to account for your questions, for our processes and our findings? And what will happen if you do not realize becoming and being a network scholar and researcher? I'm closing with three quotations. Uh, this is a beautiful small book, Letters to a Young Poet by, uh, uh, by a poet, Renir Maria Rilke which wrote this to a younger poet. I beg you to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. 
don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything, live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in future, you will gradually, without even noticing, live your way into your answer. In the deepest hour of the night, confess to yourself that you would die if you were forbidden to write. And look deep into your heart and where it spreads its root and the answer and ask yourself, must I write? And colleagues, I conclude, I'm not fearless. I'm terrified, but I write anyway. I pretend no one is going to read my words and I try to make sense of this world that is so breathtaking and beautiful and complicated and hideous. And that is Roxanne Gay. I thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much for the opportunity.